Good morning. Oh, no, evening. evening. Boy, what do you know? I'm used to so used to good mornings. It's evening this time. You caught me off guard. Uh, we're so glad that you're joining, you're joining us here tonight. It's a blessing to have you here with us on our final evening of Prophetic Signs. It seems like it just started a couple days ago. But, it did start by a couple days well, ago. Well, last weekend. <laughs> a few more and, couples. And <laughs> uh, so it, it, it has moved very quickly, but we are so thankful for this time that we have, not only together, our last time, but with each of you in this audience and those online who are joining us. This doesn't have to be the end. No. I'll give some information at the end of the, the program tonight that will help you stay connected, uh, you know, because... I pastor a church here in the Phoenix Valley, and most of our online viewers in the Phoenix Valley, I want to get to know them. I want to connect with you. And so if you haven't had a chance to come out here and you are joining us online, uh, we're going to send out maybe a Zoom invite and some other things that we can use to follow up and just connect and answer questions and help you in your walk with the Lord, because it is an important time to talk about that walk with Jesus, it especially sure right now. Yes. Amen. So thank you for being here. My wife, Rochelle. My name's John Stanton. It's our last time here to host our prophet, prophetic signs together. Yes, and you know we've been doing a question for each meeting, and we've got a question for tonight. So our last question you get to answer. <laughs> when we look at the world around us, there are a lot of horrible things going on. And whether it be war that's happening, crime, um, the planet having trouble, all kinds of problems. How can that be happening when we have a good God? Yeah, uh, this, is a, this is a question that many ask. In fact, uh, atheists use it as an argument against the existence of God. You know, if God is so good, why is all the bad stuff happening in the world? And um, we read the Bible and throughout we find some things that are difficult for us to understand, but also we find a God that is loving and compassionate. Uh, Jeremiah says, let me see, it's in Jeremiah 31, says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. With loving kindness, I have drawn you. So God is in constant action to draw people with his love. The problem and the disadvantage here, and to some degree a disadvantage for God, is that there's also a devil. And the devil does terrible things. Um, there's a parable in Matthew 13, um, it's a kingdom is like parable, uh, of a man that was sowing good seed in his field, and he went out and looked later, and all of a sudden there were weeds everywhere. And someone asked him, you know, how could this happen? And his answer was, an enemy has done this. And I want to carry that forward to today. What we see around the world isn't just good stuff, it's got some pretty bad stuff. An enemy is doing that. And one day, God will set it right. That enemy will be put down, and God's kingdom will reign. As we see in prophecy, we've been seeing this over and over again, God wins out, and evil and sin and suffering will be no more. That's part of the, the message tonight, so I, I'm glad that we're having this question right now. So this is truly... Don't blame God. This is an enemy who does a lot of these terrible things. I can't wait for that day when the enemy is no more. Yes, yeah, you and <laughs> me both. can't wait for heaven. Well, to, to give us a taste of heaven this evening as we get started, I want to invite Jesus to come up and share with us another musical number. The shout that calls the dead to life. 
Thank you so much. She's a beautiful song. Uh, some of you have already inquired, because I've been hearing about it, who is that group that is singing and how can I get their music? Well, let me tell you how you can get their music. Uh, you can go to their website, cheesamusic.com. Very simple. The only challenge is the spelling of Cheesa. It took me a while to figure that out. But it's, it's, it's simple once you get it. C-Y-I-Z-A, cheesamusic.com, C-Y-I-Z-A, music.com. Make sure you check it out because you can get lots of stuff there, their music, and leads as to what they're doing in their ministry, a beautiful ministry. Thank you so much for being here with us during the second weekend of Prophetic Signs. Let's pray tonight before we begin. Father in heaven, I thank you for how you've blessed us so much throughout this series. And now when we've come to the final meeting, I pray one more time that you would speak to my heart, my mind, and through me to touch our lives, that we might understand your word better and what's going on in the world around us. And most of all, how Jesus is with us throughout. We thank you 
so much for what you are doing and will do in, in the lives of those who have joined us through this series. In Jesus' name, amen. Newsweek magazine reported uh, something fairly interesting this year, just a little over a month ago. The title of the article was, Scientists Make Message to Send Earth's Location to Aliens, Ignoring Stephen Hawking's Warning. I thought, well, that's interesting. Just a little snippet from that. Scientists have recently designed a new message called the Beacon in the Galaxy, B-I-T-G, message that they hope will be received and understood by an intelligent alien civilization. The BITG message gives a group of cosmic landmarks to provide the location of Earth within our Milky Way galaxy. The question of whether or not we are alone in the universe has tantalized scientists for decades. But efforts to find intelligent or even microbial life anywhere else but Earth has been unsuccessful. The late physics professor Stephen Hawking expressed concerns many times that humans calling out to the vastness of space and contacting aliens, that these efforts might end up backfiring. <laughs> uh, they, he says, who knows, they may even have a complete different behavior. Uh, something would say humanity's own behavior is a sign that aliens won't necessarily be friendly. Now, a few things, of course, come to mind. Number one, the question is, you know, is Hawking right about this whole thing? I mean, should we not be sending our signals out to, you know, uh, outer space to contact aliens? Uh, honestly, when someone has a belief and trust in God, there is nothing we need to be concerned about, number one. But to me, I don't, it's not even, uh, let me give you just a few thoughts just a few things about the whole idea of contacting aliens. Number one, God has put it in the heart of mankind to be curious about what's happening in outer space. This doesn't surprise me that we want to know if there's other life forms out there. That's fine. That's great. And all the power to them. But I can honestly say that they're not going to find anything. I guarantee it. They're not going to find a response. And here's why I know that. You see, God created everything in the universe, including our planet. Inhabited worlds in other planets around the universe, they're not interested in contacting this fallen world. You see, because when sin entered the world, first of all, rebellion in heaven, and then it came to this earth, when Adam and Eve sinned, it became the location of the great conflict between good and evil. It's restricted here. This is where it's happening, unfortunately for us. But this is where it resides. Unfallen world, worlds that are out there that know God as their creator have no interest in connecting with us. They're waiting for this whole issue to be resolved and for us to be reconciled and this earth to be recreated before there's any relations at all. So will they find other worlds with other Life forms, absolutely not. It doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means they're not interested in being found or connecting with us. So we don't need to worry about this. Listen, our hope isn't in reaching out to find some other alien life forms to connect with and to grow in our science and technology under understanding of the universe. No, our hope is in Jesus Christ who has promised to come back to this world to save you and I and all those that trust him from the enemy who's trying to work out our demise. That is our great hope. Amen? And so that is what we're going to talk about here tonight. We're talking about the day of deliverance. This is the day that we're waiting for, that's on the horizon, that Jesus is coming soon to deliver us. You know, just a, another quick side note, you've heard some of these things on UFOs, you know, how do UFOs fit in all this? I, I just have a simple answer for you. I think fallen angels, they're bored. And they have fun. And they throw things out there, here, little here, little there, and we're, ch we're chasing after it, look. And they laugh. It's just, yeah, this stuff will soon be over. 
And I'm so glad Jesus is on his way. You know, Jesus didn't say that he was to his disciples when he met with them in their last meeting there in the upper room and he talked about these things along with the message he gave them on the Mount of Olives before he was crucified. He didn't say that he was coming back quickly. He said he was coming back. And then in his description of things that were happening or would happen before he came back, in that context, he would say, when you see these things, then know that I'm coming back quickly. So, you know, some would say, well, listen, it's been 2,000 years and Jesus hasn't come back. Well, he didn't say it would be quick. He just said that it would be soon and keep watching. And those words are for every generation that has existed between his resurrection and ascension to heaven and, of course, us who down at the end of time live right before his return. He said in Matthew 24, 32, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. So these signs were to tell us when the second coming is near. It's soon. It's right upon us. And there are several signs we find in Matthew 24. False Christs, rumors, wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, disease, earthquakes, persecution or martyrdom, false prophets, disregard for law, increasing evil, love grown cold in the hearts of mankind. We've seen a lot of that, haven't we? And then, of course, the gospel preached to all the world is one of those signs as well. These are signs that Jesus coming is near right at the doors. Is there anything on this list that hasn't happened yet? I would suggest to you, no. Even this last one, the gospel preached to the entire world, for the most part, the gospel is going to the entire world. Now, I can't sit here and say every single person has heard the gospel because that's not true. But in every part of the world, the gospel of Jesus is going out and people are being reached. And especially with our improvements to technology and other things, it has grown rapidly, uh, the gospel going out to the world over the last few decades. Rochelle and I were traveling into California Her and I both grew up in Northern California and we were back there for a visit. This was last year. And uh, unfortunately, we went through the city of San Francisco. We said, hey, wouldn't it be nice to go through Golden Gate Park and just ride our bikes around? And we did. And when we came back to our car, this is what we found. Um, Both the side back window and the back window, there's another picture here, were broken open. And some people were very kind. They came over and they said, hey, I just wanted to stick around and tell you what happened. And it was a, a young girl from, I don't know, where, where was she from? Stockton, that's right, Stockton. She said, oh, I felt so bad. She says, I was in the car and I pulled up right behind you to park. And I saw you, you were just leaving. Your bikes were in the horizon and leaving. And these people jumped out and they smashed your windows and grabbed your bags. I lost probably six grand of stuff in two bags that they got from me. I was mad. (laughs) I could have to say, it made me so frustrated. What are they doing? And then we started to learn, we started to read. They're calling it, uh, they were calling it San Francisco snow. Speaking of the the, the glass that was falling all over the place, all over the seats of the streets of the city. And now as you look around, as you read, it's not just San Francisco. This is happening everywhere. And people are wondering in these cities, what do we need to do to get this to stop? This is just ridiculous. What's going on with crime in this world? My friends, it's not going to get better. Crime will continue to grow. And sadly, we're here for the duration. 
Paul describes in his letter to Timothy, his second letter, chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, he says, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, obedient to par- disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, the uns. Slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, and even some that profess to be Christian, in other words, but they deny its power. And from such people, turn away. It's almost like reading the headlines of our newspapers today. It's a sad commentary on our society Climate change may be the hot topic today, but in our current condition and where things look like they're going, this world will fall apart on its own even before climate change does its damage. These words from Jesus also say a lot about what's happening today and what our government and leaders and others are trying to do to ward off society's rapid changes and the challenges that all of us face. Jesus said there will be signs in Luke 21, there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then notice the next line. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. You see, the distress of nations with perplexity, in other words, what are we doing about, what can we do about this whole war in Ukraine and with what Putin is doing? We're kind of, we're not sure what he's gonna do. Is he gonna push the button for the atomic bomb? You know, nuclear bomb, is he going to, you know, what is his next move? And then, of course, men's hearts filling them from fear at what's coming upon the world. Let me tell you, there's a lot of anxiety. Over and over, I'm reading these stories about, uh, you know, people with, they're, they're incredibly stressed out. There's a lot of depression out there in the world, and it's growing exponentially because of the challenges and the stresses that life is bringing to people. And so, what can we do about this? Well, we don't have answers. There are no answers. Jesus is the only answer. In this world, there are, there's nothing we're going to be able to do to stay this tide. But Jesus has a plan, and he's coming back soon. I think this tells us how important it is not to trust in the things of this world, to put our confidence in our stuff, in the life that we have, the comfort we enjoy, because these things are passing away. John spoke about that in his letter to the church, 1 John 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of a father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Friends, we need to be storing our treasures in heaven. That's what will last forever. Not the things of this world. Are you caught up with the things of the world? Or are you caught up with Jesus? I like to think that most of my time I spend, I spend with the Lord at my side, not trying to advance whatever I need to get ahead of, you know, ahead of the world, ahead of the next thing, the latest technology, the newest car. Because it's all, in one preacher's words, it's all going to burn. It's all going to burn up. Those things just don't matter. 
There are people that have tried to set dates for the end of the world. Over the last few decades, it's kind of a thing. I don't know, maybe it's because we were approaching the year 2000 and everybody thought, oh man, this is about it. 2,000 years from Christ's, you know, first appearance and now we're almost there. Just a few of them, Hal Lindsey, you familiar with Hal Lindsey? He wrote a book, The Late Great Planet Earth. That was a big one. He predicted Jesus would come in 1988. Well, we know that his prediction failed, right? He still has a TV program where he guides people through his teachings on prophecy. I'm not sure I want to put a lot of credibility in his conclusions at this point, right? It says if a prophet prophesies of something that comes to pass, that should come to pass, and it doesn't, what is he? It's a false prophet. Edgar Wiseman wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why the Lord is Going to Come by 1988. There's that date again. It sold over four and a half million copies. Wiseman has quoted as saying, only if the Bible is in error or error am I wrong. Only if the Bible is in error am I wrong. Can you believe it? And say, to that, to every, say that to every preacher in town. He went on to say that if he was to gamble with his life, he would stake it on the coming of Jesus on Rosh Hashanah, September 12, 1988. Trinity Broadcasting Net Network interrupted their programming a few days before to tell people to get ready for the rapture, the secret rapture. After the day passed, the network returned to their normal programming as scheduled. What else are they going to do, right? It was wrong. Harold Camping first wrote a booklet that predicted the end of the world could possibly occur in 1994. Then in 2001, Camping warned that the end was coming. On May 21st, 2011, there's going to be an incredible earthquake, way bigger than anything the earth has ever experienced, and that'll be the beginning of Judgment Day. Get this, this is staggering. He invested nearly $100 million into advertising to spread the news. $100 million. And then when the day passed, you could hear the drain. Amazing. Last one, Ronald Wienland, or Wineland, is a former worldwide Church of God minister who broke away from the church and predicted the second coming of Jesus on September 29, 2011. When his first prediction failed, he changed the date two more times and then he gave up. Didn't seem like it was going to happen, nor did it happen. If only they had listened to Jesus, right? But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. It's a simple, a simple statement. In the middle of all the prophecy, which talks about the second coming, Jesus says, no one knows. You can't figure it out. He even said that he didn't know at that moment. He didn't know. His Father in heaven knew only. But he knew that the signs would come that revealed it was near, and that's what he focused on giving to his disciples and to us today. And the only thing that these false prophecies really do is kind of give Christianity a bad name. You know, look at this. They say Jesus is coming and he's not coming. They keep missing him. No, he's coming. We just don't know when he's coming, but he's coming soon. All these signs that Jesus gave us in Matthew 24 point to the second coming. That's the thrust of the whole chapter because that's where the, that was the answer the disciples had looked for. When will be the signs of these things? When is the sign of your coming? And Jesus tells them. But in that warning of all the signs that we listed, there's one sign that I think we need to pay a little more attention to, and I want to kind of hone in on it. 
because he's giving general signs and then he gives a very specific one. And here's what he says in Matthew 24, same chapter again, verse 23. If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. In other words, the deception is going to try to deceive God's people, his followers, those that are trusting him and are faithful to him. See, I have told you beforehand. Then notice this. He shifts subtly, just slightly. Verse 26, therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert. Do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So if someone says to you, hey, Jesus has come back, what do you do? You don't believe it. You know, he's appearing over here secretly. Don't believe it. Because when Jesus comes, it'll be like lightning that flashes from the east to the west. And when you are outside and lightning flashes, you see it. Everyone will see it when Jesus comes. But he's warning in here of a very specific false Christ. Because there are many false Christs, he said, that are leading up to this time. But when he comes, the Antichrist comes. Then we need to be aware and resist him. I believe that he's referring to a time that is spoken of in Revelation 13, where the alliance of evil is set up its, it's he's set in place to battle the enemy, their enemy, who is Christ and his church. And then this last great deception occurs. So know this, behold, Jesus is coming with clouds and it says every eye will see him. That's how you know Jesus has come back. But who is this person that is a false Christ that pretends to be Christ that's coming back? I've already mentioned that Satan loves to counterfeit the things that God does. God is a trinity of persons. We said this earlier in our last presentation. Satan has his own three that have come together in his alliance. God has a church, a pure woman is the symbol. Satan has a church, the great harlot. God has apostles. Satan has apostles. God has a message in the last days, the three angels' messages. Satan has a message in the last days, the three frogs, which we learned earlier. So he's going to try to pull something off, a counterfeit of the second coming of Jesus. And while he cannot flash light around the world from the east to the west as far as an eye can see, he can come in a way that deceives. And this is what is described in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It says in verse 7, the Lord Jesus, actually it, it describes what, how Jesus will come and then of course it's going to be mimicked by this false, false Christ. It says the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, knowing this, that Jesus is coming in what? Flaming fire. Satan says, okay, I like this fire concept. Remember earlier we saw Mount Carmel, the fire that came down out of heaven. People said he's God. Jesus is coming in flaming fire. I'm going to pull something off here. I think I can do it. Satan reads the Bible, remember? He knows the Bible very well. And he wants to counterfeit the second coming of Jesus. Now, many Christians believe that the Antichrist is a human being. 
It's someone that steps up into this position of antichrist and appears on the scene after the church has been secretly raptured. In other words, this rapture of the church happens, the church is gone, and that, that week period, this seven years period of tribulation, then the middle of that period, this antichrist steps up and he forms, um, he breaks a pact that he has with the Jews and begins to bring persecution, et cetera, et cetera. This is popularized by the books, the Left Behind books by Tim LaHaye. The movies as well, even those, those movies and books, they're very much a dispensationalist, futurist perspective on prophecy. This is the story that it portrays, but it isn't coming from the Bible. So what is Satan up to? It says in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. There's the counterfeit apostles I was just talking about. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into what? An angel of light. Now, this is amazing. The word here for light, the word there is phos in the Greek. You know what it means? Fire. Satan transforms himself into an angel of fire to come as a dazzling being of brightness on fire. And it'll appear like he comes from heaven. Satan's master plan is to personate Christ himself. You know what the difference is between a personator and an impersonator? A personator is one that pretends to be someone that he's not, but it's deceptive. In other words, people don't know that it's a fake person. Like Zelensky, someone was trying to personate him in that video we saw in the last meeting. An impersonator is someone that everybody gets together and laughs about because they know it's not the person and they're just impersonating somebody else, okay? But when someone seeks to personate, they're trying to do it deceitfully as if to be the person, you know, that to deceive people into thinking that they are that person that they are not. And this is going to be what Satan does. In his crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan will personate Christ. The great deceiver will make it appear that Jesus has returned. In different parts of the earth, Satan will appear as a majestic being of dazzling brightness. The glory that surrounds him is beyond anything that this world has ever seen. People will shout, Christ has come. He's here. He's here. And in that one act, this miraculous act, this sign that comes from heaven, this fire that comes from heaven, Satan will unite the world behind him. He will step in. He will endorse this alliance between the two beasts. Remember chapter 16 we saw earlier. This is the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet together. This is the dragon showing up, and he's in cahoots with the beast, Rome, and the second beast, which is the false prophet, the United States. No more Catholics, no more Protestants, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, or atheists fighting over who's right. All they will know is what they see, and they will follow him. This is why the devil loves the, the red goat-looking character with the pitchfork, because they will not expect the devil to look like that. And what do you think will happen when multitudes are following him and God's people step forward and say, that's Antichrist, that's Satan. And they're convinced that it's Jesus. Do you think they might have a problem with that? Talk about creating an us and them, a cancel culture right there, a reality. Those who believe God's word 
knowing that it's not Christ but Satan, and who speak up about it, will be canceled by society. More than just even the day of worship, which there's already disagreement on, they will see them and ostracize them as crazy. And then as Satan calls for a law honoring Sunday, which he claims is his day, they thinking Christ is doing that because of course all the churches already honor that day or hold that day sacred, they will follow it, they will make those laws and they will begin to enforce them. What is going to happen to those then that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Canceled. Jesus said in John 16, 2, that the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. The time is coming. What time is Jesus referring to? He's talking about the time of trouble. And no, the church will not be gone during the time of trouble. The church will be here still. But the time of trouble will come and it will be difficult. Speaking about the time of trouble, it says in Daniel 12, 1, at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Isn't this good news? Delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. You see, God doesn't just stand by and let the time of trouble happen, destroying his people. He stands up and delivers them. This whole idea of the church being gone during the time of trouble, it's not found in the Bible. It is a futurist slash dispensationalist teaching understanding of that 70th week of Daniel. I know I've mentioned this before, but it's worth covering again. Where that last week is moved down to the end of time, and it talks about this prince who is to come. They say that's the Antichrist. The problem with that is in the middle of that last week, it already said that the Messiah appears. It's the messianic prophecy. You can't move that week to the end of time. It just doesn't work theologically, or even in a scholarly way, if you're trying to be honest and fair to Scripture. God does not take people out of the earth before trouble. He watches over them and guides them, protects them through trouble. He has done that repeatedly. Every time as people get into trouble, he doesn't lift them out. He gets them through it. And this is why David, the psalmist, wrote Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is a psalm that we can claim in the time of trouble. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. What is pestilence? Disease. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth... Look at this. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. In other words, that's your defense. That's, your, that's what holds you up. You shall not be afraid of terror by night, nor of the arrows that fly by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. And then look at this. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. What do you have to, where do you have to be to see something happen? You have to be there. You see, God is guiding us through us. He's protecting us through this. But with our eyes, we will see it happening around us to the people who do not trust in God as their protector. That means the church is here, being defended, being sheltered, with God as their mighty fortress. Is he your fortress today? The tri time of trouble is nothing to worry about with God by your side.
I want, to I want to explore here the passage that futurist dispensationalists use to advance the secret rapture theory, this idea that before the time of trouble, the church is gone, it's raptured out secretly. You probably have seen some of the pictures of this kind of thing happening, you know, in the movies, people just lift off or they're flying a plane and a few people disappear on the plane and all this stuff. It's a vivid picture, but this is what people have in their minds. Christians, most Christians believe that the secret rapture is coming, especially evangelicals. In Matthew 24, we're, bad, we're, we're in mostly Matthew 24 today, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. You see, in Noah's day, they weren't paying attention to the message. They were, they were paying attention to just things carrying on as life always does. Until that door closed, and then seven days later, the rain starts to fall, and the floods came up from under the ground. The same situation exists today, sadly. People aren't listening to the message that God has for them. Be saved. Come into my fortress, my ark, and I will protect you. But we still preach it. The flood came. It took them all away. Who did it take away, by the way? Who were taken away by the flood? All of them, those that we would say are the wicked, antediluvians, the mockers against God, those that it says in Genesis that their thoughts were only evil continually. They were taken away by the flood and they perished. So when you look at that passage, that the flood came and took them all away, then you have to immediately say, well, who was taken away? Well, it was the wicked. This is verified in Luke, Luke's account, Luke 17. The same story, but instead of the flood came and took them all away, he says the flood came and destroyed them all. So the taking them all away is not good, is it? Look at the next verse, the next few uh, verses here in Matthew 24. This is a continuation of the story. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, making their flour, they're doing their, their business. One will be taken and the other left. It's interesting, the disciples hearing this, they asked him, well, where? Where, Lord? Where are they taken? And Luke tells us, the answer. He said to them, where the corpse is, there will, the vultures will gather. They were taken to destruction. And that's what he's saying, in the, as in the days of Noah, so it will be when God comes, when Jesus comes, that they will be taken to destruction, which is where the vultures are gathered together. So you do not, according to this story, want to be taken. Being left behind is good. Say amen to that. You'll want to be left behind. Yet, what does the Left Behind series tell you? You want to be taken. You don't want to be left behind because left behind is the tribulation. No, you're reading the text absentmindedly, maybe not carefully, but you're missing the point. The flood took the wicked don't be taken, you want to be left behind. Paul also describes those who are saved at the second coming of Jesus. He says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Is this a quiet event? No, this is very loud, right? No one is, is, is missing what they're seeing and hearing. And I mean, this is, is, is earth shattering and changing. Then he says, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are, what? Alive and remain. In other words, we who are left will be what? Caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. You see, those that are alive and remain, the ones that are left behind, aren't taken away by the flood. They're the ones that are caught up, are raptured, but not secretly. They're raptured up to meet the Lord in the air, and they go to live with the Lord forever. That's the truth of God's word. There's no ambiguity there. The true rapture is not a secret. And there's only one, and it happens at the resurrection of Jesus, of his saints. The resurrection of his saints. There is much confusion about Christ's returns and what happens when he comes the second time. There's a couple things I think that just be good to remember. Just keep in mind. Number one, the second coming coincides with the resurrection of the saints. So when Jesus comes back, the saints are resurrected. This is clear throughout several passages in the New Testament. One, one of them we just read. Here's another one. Matthew 24, verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and then they, when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet. There's that trumpet again. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This gathering and catching up to meet Christ in the air. But the second thing is that the second coming, the earth is burned up with no human life left on it. Peter says in his second letter to the church, Chapter 3, verse 10, but, on that, on the, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. People say, oh, see, look, he's coming secretly. Well, keep reading. In which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Is that secret? <laughs> and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. You see, when Jesus comes, he, everything is destroyed, not because of his intent, but because of the brightness of his coming. He's so powerfully lit up on fire that everything is devoured on this earth, except his saints. Because the beauty of what happens with the saints are that they receive new bodies, <laughs> and they're transported to his presence, and they get to go live with him in his presence in heaven. Those that are mistaken with the idea that Jesus will secretly, secretly rapture his church to heaven and then come back seven years later for people who took advantage of their second chance doesn't come from the Bible because Christ's return is anything but a secret event. In fact, it's not only visible, it's extremely loud and it's destructive as well to the earth. Here's something else. When Jesus returns, it's not to set up his kingdom on earth. Because the earth is scorched at that time. It's to take his people out of this earth to have it with him. There's this whole mistaken idea that when Jesus appears visibly, that that happens after the secret rapture, seven years after that, and he will set up his kingdom on the earth. Again, another false teaching. He doesn't set up his kingdom on this earth. He only comes once. There's no second chance. Was there a second chance for those in the days of Noah? No. So when he comes, it will be a, a 
complete devastation of this earth because he's taken his people out of it to heaven with him. Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, where is Jesus right now? He's in heaven. You may be also. I'm coming back to get you, to receive you, and so that you can be with me where I am, which is in heaven. That's the place that Jesus has prepared a place for us. He's right now preparing a place for you. And he's going to come back and he's going to take you there at his second coming. This is what the ancients have longed for. A place they could call their own. You know, Canaan, the promised land, was supposed to be temporary. And it never quite measured up to what they expected, right? There were a lot of enemies and constantly the Philistines were attacking them and all the others from the different nations around them. But this time, there won't be any of that. Because the promised land is a heavenly one and there is no enemy there. I long for that day. The writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 11, verse 16, but now they, again speaking of the ancients of the Old Testament, desire a better, that is a heavenly country, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That city is the new Jerusalem. That's what Jesus is preparing and has preparing, been preparing for a long time. Even those in the Old Testament knew that that city one day would belong to them because God was preparing it for them. We've been going through the book of Revelation on this second weekend. And we saw the unfolding of the great controversy and the battle between good and evil in chapter 12. We saw Satan shift and go after the church. He hated that last church that were keeping the commandments of God. So he set up an alliance, chapter 13. That alliance to go after those that were loyal and faithful to God, keeping his commandments, including the fourth, the Sabbath of the Lord, our God. And then in 14, we see the message, the, the very con, uh, opposite message of that from the false trinity, the alliance that had been created. We see a message that comes from the 144,000, God's church raised up in the last days to preach the everlasting gospel to the world. And as a result of that message, there's a great harvest at the end of chapter 14 of all people, because the earth, the harvest of the earth is ripe. See, that's just a, a quick overview synopsis. We didn't go into all the details, but I think you can see clearly what the battle is in these last days and what is to come. And that next thing that is to come is Jesus and his kingdom. And we will live with him forever. I want to read, because I just love to read this passage. I'm going to read... The description of Jesus coming in Revelation 19. That's where you find it in Revelation. John says in verse 11, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. You see, when Jesus comes back a second time, it won't be as a babe in a manger or a meek and mild Messiah. He's coming back differently because this time he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. 
Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. You know why the sharp sword's coming out of his mouth? The word of God is like a two-edged sword, right? It's the word. Because he's called the word of God here. It's the word that judges us. We've, we looked at this in a prior study. So that sharp sword, he strikes the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of God, of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, say it with me, King of kings and Lord of lords. I can't wait for this day. I wish it were tomorrow, tonight. But it's not. But it's soon. That's what God promised. Reading these words keeps me focused on preparing to meet Jesus. And when I meet him, I'm going to be looking around too. Once we connect, I'm going to look around for others that I know. Family, friends, loved ones. Because it's going to be a great reunion in the sky. Because as we saw in the last study, that our loved ones haven't gone on before us to heaven. They are raised, they're resting in the grave, and they are raised to go into the heavens and to appear for the first time, all of us together in the kingdom of heaven, the city that God has prepared for us. It says in chapter 20, right after the second coming, it says that the saints that go to be with Christ in heaven live with him there for 1,000 years. For 1,000 years. In Revelation 20, verse 4, And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. In other words, this first resurrection triggers these events. So this thousand years, you can see clearly, this isn't a thousand years on the earth. They lived and reigned with Christ. Where is Jesus? In heaven. They reigned with him for a thousand years. When that second coming happens and the fire devours the world the wicked will die at that time there will be no one left to bury them so they will be dead for those thousand years and it says here that the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished what is that telling you that they too will be raised but they won't be raised until the thousand years are over, which is the second resurrection. You see, there are two resurrections. The first is of the righteous, God's people. The second one is after a thousand years, and that's of the wicked. And they're raised for judgment. It describes that judgment in Revelation 20, verse 12. John says, I saw the dead. The dead speaking now of those that are alive, but they're spiritually dead. This, these are those who are the wicked who did not accept Christ, but they stand on their own accord. The dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. This is a judgment scene. And another book was open, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. I don't want to get too distracted by this, but I just, just a comment here. You see, the, the judgment here of the wicked is a review of their books. Have you ever heard this statement, I can read you like a open book? Well, in Scripture, it, talks, it has these books that keep record of our lives. And these, bo these books that are open and look, they're reviewed, they have no record of Christ in them. So they're judged by their own works, what they did. And those works were evil, not of good. You see, the blessing of being in Christ is that your sins are covered by the blood 
that Jesus shed for you. And when those books are reviewed before the second coming, when those books are reviewed, the judgment simply is a check mark in Christ. Christ's life was perfect. His life is credited to you. All the stuff that you did that you're not proud of, all the sins that you committed, gone, covered by the blood of Christ. So we don't have those concerns about the judgment. The judgment to us is, praise God, there's a judgment. Vindicate us, O God, by virtue of what Jesus has done for me. That's what faith in Christ is, not just spending every day with him, but there is a transaction that he has accomplished, that he has done for you that allows you to stand before the throne room of God in him without your own life record being seen. Your life record is Christ's life for you. Beautiful. That's how we stand today for those who believe in Jesus. But heaven is not our final destination. I have one more text. Heaven's not our final destination. We're living there a thousand years, but then what? It says in Revelation 21, verse 1, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. The old stuff is gone. The new is coming. Then I, John, saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So wait a minute, the city was in heaven. We're in the city for a thousand years. What's happening to the city now? It's coming down out of heaven. Where's it going? And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. That city, his tabernacle, wherever God resides, that's where he tabernacles with us. In the city, it's coming down. And it says, he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God forever. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. <laughs> now I'm really getting excited. <laughs> The former things have passed away. The stuff that concerns me every day when I wake up and throughout the day, those are gone. Whatever's troubling you, those are gone. Not even a tear comes after that point. And we will live in an earth made new. The earth will be recreated right in front of our eyes. If you ever wondered how God created the earth the first time, you're going to get to see it. And it's recreation the second time. And this will end up being our final home. We will live here forever. Uh, and here's the most amazing thing. God moves his residence here. It was, it's been in heaven forever. Now he's coming here. The ones that were cast off, you and me and all the sinners of the past, are now his saints and sit on thrones with Jesus for eternity. Then you'll have a chance to start exploring the universe, talking to other worlds and the inhabitants of those worlds and all the other things we get to do without the pain and the sorrow and the suffering, which will hardly even come back to memory again. This is the day we are looking for. I want to invite Jesus up Talk about that wonderful, beautiful day that we all are looking forward to because it is coming soon. It's coming very soon.
and he was so bright and so fair. And when I entered the gate, I cried, Holy, and all the angels.
Glory to the Son of God. Beautiful, beautiful song and a reminder of what will be very soon. Do you want that to be your experience? I want to make an appeal specifically for those who have not made a decision to follow Jesus and to experience all the benefits of a life in him. Some of you may be here in the audience tonight. Others may be online and you want to make that commitment to Christ. If you want to commit your life to him, I want to ask you to text to the number that's on the screen. Yes, I want to commit my life to Christ. With that answer, we will follow up. We will talk with you about how you want to solidify that journey to make that decision through baptism and through your personal walk with Jesus as you wait for him to return. But I also know that we're not done after these meetings are over. I think the Lord is just starting something here. (laughs) And what he starts, he finishes if we allow him to finish. Part of that is the truths that you've been hearing. But the other part is the finishing work of getting you ready for Jesus to return. And I want to be a part of that journey to help you. So let me pray for you. And then we'll talk about where we go next in that journey. Bow your heads with me, I pray. Father, you've heard, you've seen the text. You you, you listen to our hearts cry for you. And you are hearing those responses for those who want to follow you. There are numerous people online that have been giving us positive feedback. I pray that you would reach into each home, each household, each person, and let them know that you are there. And as they have given their lives to you, this is the beginning of a journey, a beginning of a journey with Jesus. Father, I pray that you would send your spirit to comfort and strengthen them in that decision. That this won't be just some rash decision that they lose sight of in a week from now. This will be one that they're committed to, that they will follow through with because we live in a day that commitment can be a struggle. So Father, help everyone that is choosing to follow you here tonight. We ask that you would help them in that decision and in their journey beginning now. Thank you for the time that we've had over these two weekends. In this series, Prophetic Signs, you have shown up every night. You've helped prepare the notes, the message, all those things. But Lord, you have given me the strength to preach it. And I thank you for that. And for all your blessings. We have all been blessed by your word here these couple weekends. Lord, may that journey, may that study of your word continue in our lives because it's the word that we can depend upon. Not the word of man, but the word of God and the power of his Christ. It is in Jesus' name we pray tonight. Amen. Amen.